Building in Public today with Rahim Fazal from SV Academy. Welcome, Rahim. All right. Thank you. This is fun. So this is your first uh, your first visit, right? You've you've uh, I think it's your first time on Highlighter. First first visit in any session. Yeah, exactly. Cool. Yeah. Welcome. Probably my it's probably my first uh, you know time I've been with uh, two other people in the same like, <laughs> like general vicinity in a long time too. <laughs> so so you're, you're, first of many. You're, you're not uh, you're not video conferenced out from the the pandemic. You know I've. I, I did at, at a at a certain point hit a wall like a lot of people and so I've started to just do phone calls as much as possible and mm-hmm. and it's nice I mean we were just talking backstage about you know the part of the city we live in and I've lived in this neighborhood in the in the north part of San Francisco for 12 or 13 years and yeah. I've noticed I have very little connection to my neighborhood mm-hmm. because I'm always you know, going into downtown, going into the office or, you know, going to the airport or whatever. I'm in a lift or I'm in, you know, some tower. And the nice thing about the last year and a bit has been, I spent a lot more time just getting to know the people Mm -hmm. around me and my neighbors. And I noticed we have some beautiful parks here in this area. (laughs) Uh And, uh, you know, like you and I have not had a chance to, I don't know, we haven't, I don't think we've seen each other in person a a little bit, but that kind of, uh, you know, that kind of stuff is um, becoming a bigger part of my life now. Um, you know, just sort of my immediate, the connection with my immediate community and the people, people mm-hmm. uh, around me. Is that something that you were kind of explicit about trying to organize or arrange? Or was it kind of the, just the latent pent up energy from, from, you know, not having that, that made it emerge? Yeah, probably more the latter. I think I'd love to say that I had some grand, you know, design and I sat with my therapist and you know, we figured out a plan over the next, you know, eight weeks to shift my, my, you know, mental, physical state. I think it's just, um, you know, it was a consequence of, of just, <laughs> you know, city living. Uh, mm-hmm. Until recently, we were in a pretty small apartment and, and when my wife was on the phone so she's been working from home of course as well and Mm -hmm. she's on the phone and i'm on zoom and we have a baby we have a two-year-old now baby uh but as she was sort of um you know coming into her own and making more noise and so on and a nanny and so it just felt you know like it was a bit of a release valve for me Mm -hmm. to get out and uh and uh and then it emerge this beautiful like discovery uh, you know session every every call i'd go on i'd i'd um you know just go in a different completely different direction and and uh yeah i feel like i know as a result the neighborhood you know a ton better yeah. and and it'll probably become like a big i hope it becomes like a bigger part of my day to day like after this after this i have a couple more meetings which I, i'm going to try to take the um one of them by phone and just you know, go for whether whether it's like thirty minutes or forty five minutes, just go for a walk. Oh yeah, and are you over by the the beach on the north end a bit? Yeah, pretty close. So, pretty close. So the nice part about uh, where where I live is I'm right in front of the the San Francisco Bay, and so I can I can be right you know watch the watch the sailboats and yeah. see Alcatraz and and the and the bridge and so on when it's not. Uh, crazy foggy, which I think today <laughs> looks pretty clear. So I'm looking forward to that. And then, yeah. and then, yeah, I can, you know, I've been taking, uh, been taking our toddler to the beach because she loves playing in the sand with her bucket mm-hmm. and she's just experiencing <laughs> these new sensations. And it's, it's really fun in the middle of the day. Uh, if I have like an hour, um, mm-hmm. like over lunch or something, just to take my lunch out and go for a walk with her and take her out to the beach. And, and uh, it, 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 it adds like a whole different, you know, dimension to the day. Like it, mm-hmm. it, it, it feels, I feel a lot more grounded without a doubt, like a mm-hmm. lot more grounded, like physically and spiritually and, you know, emotionally not being so kind of tunnel visioned and heads down uh, as I would be if I was going into the office every day. And, mm-hmm. uh, and realizing that I actually have a whole life outside yeah. of 
you know, outside of my laptop and outside yeah. of my <laughs> friends and, and, you know, generating revenue and, <laughs> you know, and that kind of thing. There actually is this whole other life that I am a part of and it feels right. a lot. Yeah, it feels a lot easier to, to, to have that full appreciation when I, when, you know, I'm, I'm also changing my physical space a bit. Yeah. yeah, it seems like if there's one thing the pandemic has done is it's taught people kind of to try new ways of living and new ways of working and new ways of being together with family and, and kind of building new habits there. So that's nice that you get to, do you think yeah. that you'll extend that even beyond, you know, when sort of everything's over, will that mm. sort of, have you adopted new kind of patterns or habits, you know, both personally, but also sort of as a company that are more like instituted as company policy that will help people kind of keep some of those, um, those new habits. Mm. Yeah. A few things. One of them is we sort of re we reshaped the team a little bit, uh, and sort of contracted and expanded and, and we're at a bigger size now, but the team is quite distributed. And part of that is also people moved out of, we have this big office, in San Francisco, we had multiple offices. We have a big office in in downtown, and and uh, you know the whole idea was that we had we had a pretty local team at the time, and so now that's changed. People have gone home, and they've kind of moved around, and so on. So there aren't as many of us uh, here in the Bay Area. So I think I think that's part of it for sure that we've just had to get used. Like a lot of companies had to get used to you know, being a distributed workforce and have found mm -hmm. that we can actually, it's not as scary as we thought it once might be. And there's lots of upsides and there are things that we have to be mindful of. Um, so, you know, beyond sort of just the normal rhythm of, of, of running a distributed team. The other thing that we're doing is we're making, um, we're being intentional about meeting as an all hands in one location. We're trying to pick the next location right now. And we used to do a little bit of this, like once a quarter, we'd have everybody in San Francisco. And I don't know if it would be San Francisco or elsewhere, but, but trying to keep that type of cadence and get, and I think there's something about the excitement that you feel, the anticipation of knowing mm -hmm. that I'm going to see everybody in person, yeah. you know, in a couple of months. So I think that's the, that's the second thing that we want to do. And then, Third thing is we've we've started to create social activities that lend themselves, I think, pretty well to virtual. So we have almost every day right now as a company, we have some social cultural event that is happening mm -hmm. cross functional. It's we've kind of played around with time zones. So everybody gets sort of a chance, um, you know, right after work. So so it's not sort of eating into family time and mm -hmm. and that kind of thing and it's we've done everything from games nights to to like um to to meditation to art uh to like freestyle rapping mm -hmm. to to um yeah like story time and like book club um sort of a kind of an improved book club and and they're well attended i actually one thing i found is that at the beginning, I wanted everyone to attend each each one, and it was sort of a show of whether I was doing a good job or not on this dimension. And now I found, actually, it's it's really nice. People have gotten into like a bit of a rhythm, and and they show up when when it makes sense for them. And that could mean every single time, or it could just be once once a week. And and I'm also sort of getting taking a pulse of how everyone sort of NPS is on a weekly basis. Mm -hmm. Right. And it, it, it seems really consistent. So people are self-selecting, you know, with the community support based on what they need. And yep. and so I'm, I'm pretty happy with how that's going. That's cool. Have you tried uh, an improv workshop yet? Oh, I'm going to write that down. That's oh, awesome. We've, we've, got, we've got a person to connect you to. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. She does an amazing job of organizing kind of improv and hosting improv and like, Warm welcomes really? everybody in, gets everybody talking and chatting. Super low stakes, no pressure, but super fun. Oh, I love that! It reminds me a bit of what I what I've done for some friends' birthdays around organizing Airbnb experiences. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you've participated oh, wow. in any of those. I haven't. No. Oh, they're very cool. So we did one, which was a magic a magic show, mm 
and the other which was a wine tasting. But the neat part is that that the first one was a Peruvian magician, and the second one was like this Argentinian um, sommelier. And mm-hmm. so you get a bit of like not only did we get the magic show and get to drink wine and learn about, but we also got to got to experience um, and and learn a bunch about you know the country of the host's origin and and I don't think I would ever have I don't think you know we would have really I don't think it would have been really a compelling need to try that stuff out uh, if if it wasn't for you know the pandemic yeah um, yeah it's weird at all like how you think about kind of like being in touch with the fellows in your program and how you relate to them. Like I saw that tweet you just posted about the the woman who sent you a really nice message about the program. And I was just wondering how you think about like getting to know these people's stories and kind of how if Mm. that is before and after. Yeah. Going back to the reason for having that large office, we, you know, with mutual friends, David, Joe, Joe and I, and a couple others got this big office for five years and the idea was we'd we'd get to know the students, you know, both during the program and and after. In in you know in our own physical space, and we could kind of it could be like a hangout room, like a hangout area, and people could drop in, and we'd have events and all these things. And of course, like so, none of that has happened in the last year and a bit. So what it's it's what it's really sort of what it's what's emerged from there is. I'd say like a much more intentional and probably direct way of of establishing and 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 really like flourishing relationships like among the community. So so I've been doing a lot more one on one, and that's hard. You know, one on one, it's hard to it's hard to scale because we've got so many students now. But I've actually found a rhythm that's working for me, and and a lot of it is through Slack. A lot of it is through office hours or, or one-on-one video through Zoom, for example. Uh, but interestingly, I'm not noticing in terms of like the, the intimacy that the, the community feels, um, whether it's with me or others or kind of as a, as a whole, I'm not seeing much of a difference or a noticeable difference today than when we were both smaller and also meeting in person regularly. And that, I feel really excited about that because, because I think the, the, the strength of the community really takes shape when we kind of lose, we drop the physical, you know, the physical boundaries of, mm-hmm. of connection. We have, for example, you know, we have many job seekers who are coming from parts of the country that have been severely impacted by COVID and, yeah. mm-hmm. you know, areas that, you know, we wouldn't necessarily, you know, be, be in physically traveling to may not even have um, employer relationships, for example, but as a result of distributed work and a, as a result of just more intention behind, behind supporting a distributed community, we've uh, been able to create, I think, a lot more value, a lot more interaction. And generally, people seem to, to, to be much I would say neutral positive. Uh, I think in certain cases it's feeling even better, uh, you know, in, in certain relationships than than it was before. And I, I wonder actually if we could, you know, to sort of get a little bit more context on this because I I think I have mm. a little bit of context on oh yeah sure kind of the history of this, but just to sort of set it up for people who are new to learning about SV Academy. Um, mm-hmm. I think about, uh, you know, I think about maybe some of the early days. I don't even know if this this was a direct, you know, part of the path. But I remember this brown bag lunch idea. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's, <laughs> was oh, that yeah. kind of, was that this or was that like mm-hmm. a part of the the starting point here? Or that, that was one of my favorite ideas. And I, I now that I say it out loud. It I remember, is, yeah. We are kind of doing that ourselves here now. <laughs> is this, isn't that kind of cool? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, I remember you really liked that idea. And loved it. And I think for, like, I think for good reason. And I, I think like what we're talking about here, the spirit of connection and connection in the workplace was a great jumping off point for SV Academy and ultimately you know, shaped where we are today. I think the general idea at that time was, 
how do we bring, how do we make education uh, sort of a core part of the work, workplace, um, you know, both in terms of skill building as well as community. And, you know, one of the traditional formats was the brown bag lunch. And so we started there. And, and what we learned was that, that people really enjoyed connecting around learning. But the challenge was that employers weren't taking it seriously enough to see it as a must have versus a nice to have. And so when it came to when it came to paying, when it came to making commitments that for let's say multiple sessions, you know, for a period of time on a kind of per seat basis or the way my enterprise brain works, it would all like the, the, the budget would be constrained to something pretty pretty both small as well as uh, experimental and mm -hmm. typically you know within hr or the people function which is mm -hmm. pretty underfunded to begin with right and we we struggled to create the direct connection between the investment these these companies were making and performance and and if or you know and productivity and if 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 mm -hmm. we couldn't if we couldn't create that direct relationship we felt it would be tough to to really build a like a world changing company right and we so but but we did see the spark like we in fact it was called spark talks and we saw the spark in the eyes of the uh, the teams that would come and participate in these sessions and and so there was definitely something valuable and ultimately we took a pretty hard pivot in some ways where we realized first of all this couldn't happen the brown bag lunch pee thing had to happen virtually it, it, it couldn't happen it couldn't go office to office to office it was just really really hard even within san francisco even within the city sometimes at that time and i think it's sort of coming back with traffic and so on just going like from one end to the other. Yeah. So, th you know, they would create all these legit and then, you know, having matching the speakers and the schedules and all these things. So anyhow, so we did it, we, we shifted virtual and, and, and we started doing these things virtually. And then, and then we realized that we had to go kind of um, function by function. And so the most obvious function uh, for us ended up being sales. Uh, largely because that's just where most of my relationships are. Like I just know more sales leaders because of my enterprise background. And then the third pivot was, or the third sort of refinement, and this one was big, was, wow, I'd actually like you to focus on not the general population in my sales organization, but actually uh, the new hires or possibly even like the pre-hires, hmm. uh, the ones that, you know, if we just kind of go farther and farther back into the funnel, like the people who are applying for our jobs. And then what about mm -hmm. the people that are not applying for our jobs? And we just sort of kept moving back and back. And then ultimately, ultimately we realized actually the best place for us to start this relationship around learning is actually for, for folks who have not yet or are just about to or want to uh, break into the industry, break into their career path uh, in tech. And if we could establish a relationship with them there, first of all, there was budget to access because there's a ton right. of budget for talent acquisition, particularly in sales. And then the second thing is we could create that relationship and that culture around learning early so it could continue over the lifetime uh, of, of, that, of that learner. Because you know, sales is one of these beautiful career paths where it's very hard at the beginning, like you do very difficult, like kind of mind numbing. It can feel at times work with cold calling and, and just doing mm -hmm. kind of data enrichment and list building and emailing and all this thing, all these things. But then as you build the, the foundational skill sets and you prove yourself, there's there are some pretty clear opportunities for you to, to move up the ladder. And so, so that's, that's sort of a roundabout way uh, that we, you know, came across 
sort of the model where we that, that we have today, starting with just a very simple, like let's let's grab yeah. some lunch and sit down and talk about learning. You know, let's talk about yeah, that's, skills. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. Wait, we, so what what were the brown bag lunches? Because I'm curious. I, I didn't have background on that. What kind of things were you exchanging, and how did you even think of that? Well, a lot of it was we would we would find an author like so just we have friends who have written books and these things as we do in 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 where we live and so like everyone's writing a book and so i you know i i i went to my one of my friends chris Ye, who wrote uh the alliance with um with another friend ben and and then reed hoffman and and there was there there were some like Real, there was some a really amazing content in that book that Chris loved to to share and talk about, and was also an opportunity for him to introduce his book and sort of the broad his some of his broader ideas, you know, into into the industry. And so that's an example of a, a set a series of talks that we repeated um, several times over. And that one was a bit more general, and then you know we started to get into some specific things. So we'd get, of course, you know, we'd go and we did deliver this talk on the alliance, and it was it was it was sort of more general um, in terms of building relationships with your with your with your managers, um, uh, you know, for advancement. And then we'd get feedback, but oh well, you know, there could we do something more specific and something something more tailored around communication? So, for example objection handling and then hmm. as we kind of moved into that direction we'd 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 find speakers that you know were subject matter experts for example you know former sales leaders or current sales leaders who really had something to say about that particular topic and and um it started to get quite specific actually and i noticed that the more specific we got you know the more valuable people felt it was the more applicable it was I'll tell you one one interesting learning, and then we can go back or kind of go in any direction you want. Was that we had tried a little bit of the sales spark talks with existing sales organizations, and so we take the same content that we were experimenting with for new job seekers, and we'd go into hiring employers, and and we'd even some of them who had already hired through this new model, like they'd hired our kind of pre-trained. Um, job seekers into sales positions, and then they'd come and say to us, "Can you deliver the same content to all of my my, my entire sales organization?" So, very specialized type of work in a structured fashion, the way that very similar to the way the program is structured today, even. And I actually found that that there were that there was a one big issue, which is that. In a typical organization, because there isn't a lot of intentionality around around learning as as sort of a you know prerequisite, you'd you'd it was really hard to measure the value of this training that we were doing of this of this mm-hmm. learning, and one of the one of the things that made it really difficult was that the people who go through our 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 program, the job seekers, we're selecting them across you know assessing a number of attributes but one of the attributes we're assessing is is this individual um does do they have an identity do they have a sort set of metacognitive a set of skills around sort of metacognitive skills around learning and if they don't but they could otherwise be very high potential individual contributors who can sort of who have a fundamental set of skills to do the job reasonably well we could never get them to, you know, from average to, to top performance, no matter how good our our material was, no matter how good we designed the learning experience. And so we had to, and we continue to um, select for individuals who have that attribute because it's a key differentiator of whether or not SV Academy can be valuable to them in their organization. And is that that metacognitive skill could be present in somebody from almost any background, it would seem. So do you have already like, do you have a typical career path? Like is somebody, you know, I, you know, is, is there some way to think about what, what would be a typical starting point before somebody meets SV Academy and then sort of what do they graduate to 
at the end or mm -hmm. I guess mm -hmm. probably lots of stories, but is there a, just a archetype that would help us, you know, kind of understand that picture better? Yeah. I think like mindset and sort of fund, like mindset and some foundational skills, right. Are two categories um, that we spend a lot of time assessing for. So for example, mindset, uh, you know, how committed is this person to the outcome? So how badly do they need this job? And, and then, you know, we, and then, and then, you know, the, the, the skills, like, do they have the skills to learn in a self-directed environment? So if they've got the commitment and they've got the skills to learn in a self-directed environment, just these are two kind of examples, uh, then, then we would predict that you'd, you'd be quite successful in our model. We often find that combination, but first of all, it's universal to your point. So, so it can, it can exist anywhere, but one, um, sort of prior career path that we, that sort of over indexes on this, uh, are, uh, educators. So when we think about top sales professionals, we don't often think about teachers, we don't often think about the eighth grade, you know, mm -hmm. high school teacher um, that has lost hours, for example, through the pandemic, um, you know, needs to get back on their feet, has, so, so basically has the commitment for the outcome. And, and of mm -hmm. course, kind of as a, as, you know, a result of, you know, spending time in a lot of time in the learning environment, you know, in, in various ways, including, you know, including as, as, uh, as, as an exemplar, let's say, mm -hmm. um, they, they have what, what it takes to go and get that um, outcome they're looking for in our model. And that was a non-obvious to me. I, I we, again, because typically when you think about pattern matching for sales leaders, future sales leaders, often you're looking for things like what school did they graduate from? Did they play division one? you know, I don't know, football, basketball, some type of sport, right? And, uh, and <clears throat> you know, have they done some type of direct sales before? Or have they sold cutco knives? You know, mm -hmm. uh, if you talk to a lot of sales leaders, that's, those are like three questions that they will, you know, typically ask, mm -hmm. um, you know, of HR, for example, when they're, you know, building their recruiting um, programs and so on. And uh, the reality is that, you know, majority of, of, the working population doesn't have that type of background yet does have uh, some foundational skills and, and in, in and in some cases uh, the mindset to go along with it, where they can be, you know, top performers very quickly if they just get a little bit of support. Right. And it sounds like this kind of this process you describe of going from kind of the brown bag lunch to figuring out how to interact with the HR department to, figuring out how sort of the talent acquisition to kind of now mm -hmm. this sort of upstream of talent kind of filtering and education that there's a lot of kind of twists and turns and learning yeah. and reorientation. And yeah. I wonder if you can, you know, we haven't really talked about the time frame. Mm. Like, you take us through a little bit of like, you know, it, and I, I don't know all the detail, but I feel like this was at least a multi-year process mm. to, to this. So is yeah. it like six yeah. months of this, then a year of yeah. that? Or how, how does that? Yeah. Yeah, I think, you know, the traditional Silicon Valley model is, you know, you, you, you find a co-founder, you come up with a shell of an idea, and then you apply to an accelerator like a YC or Techstars, and there's a structured process you go through. And at the end of that eight to 10 weeks or whatever it is, you're, you're, you've got a deck and you're pitching to investors. And now most likely, you've, you know, you're already you're pitching to investors in advance and things like that, right? So, so I think um, this experience has been uh, very organic in, in the sense that mm -hmm. time frame wise, uh, depending on sort of the lens you use, but, but just, you know, just to use one kind of maybe a yeah, more direct lens, I'd say it was, I'd say it was three years actually, which is crazy. Cause that's three years can be the lifespan of the beginning and the end yeah. of, of like a many, you know, many startups, um, yeah. including like wildly successful startups, right? Like the story can be written. 
in, in, a, in a really short period of time. Whereas this was something where like when I came to talk to you about the brown bag lunches, it was like this germ of, germ of an idea. And there were probably four or five major pivots along the way that each of them taking, like if you think about it as a science experiment, at least three months, you know, if, if not longer to, to kind of play out um, all the way through. And then, you know, creating the time space to do the reflection and, and kind of resetting things up again, and then deploying the next experiment. And then, of course, the harder, hardest thing for me, actually, all along was maintaining my um, kind of my emotional well being through the process, because Mm -hmm. it can feel, you know, you go out and you talk to friends like, like you and others and you talk about this experiment you're doing and then it doesn't work and then you have to regroup and then do the thing all over again and by the time we were on the third or fourth or fifth one it, I, I was feeling like holy crap like when is this actually like yeah. when am i going to figure it out like what am i doing wrong right. like maybe actually i need to create more of a formal structured process uh, you know the way the way that that others do and I just had to kind of maintain my, my patience and remind myself that it's actually in this environment, it's relatively easy to start something. The hard part is the, like, like the sustaining it. The hard part is the staying power, right? And I realized that, you know, as, as sort of second or third time entrepreneurs, the bar was really high uh, to, to, to sort of, maintain that vision around the staying power as we would play something out, you know, one or two or three years and, you know, out the gate. And so it needed to feel like really compelling, like really, really, really compelling. Uh, and, and, and so it took time, like it took time to get to that level of validation mm -hmm. for ourselves. And then once that happened, then it, then I'd say, you know, it, it actually started to go much, much faster because, because, you know, we were lined up, you know, fully kind of mind, body, soul. Yeah. Right. When, when you were in those situations where you kind of had gone down, a, you know, a three month path of experimentation, or maybe even longer sometimes, did you, you know, you got to the end of kind of an experiment, and you kind of felt like you learned something new enough to suggest that you wanted to be oriented mm -hmm. i don't know 20 degrees off or you know far mm -hmm. enough afield that it wasn't it wasn't just like a, a you know a, 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 a an evolution of sensor it, it had some evolutionary components to it but it was enough <laughs> enough yeah. i wonder you know if you can take us to that mindset were was that hard for you to figure out for yourself or was it hard for you to figure out how to communicate what you had understood with the people either friends, family, team, you know, people mm -hmm. around who were sort of set up for that. H help us think or understand kind of your mental state, you know, around, around those moments. Because I think there's a lot of people who go through those and, you know, it's not a typically talked about. Right. It's, it's a challenging thing. You don't know, are, you know, are we just bad at this or is this just hard, you know? Yeah, right, right, right. Yeah, I think... So a couple of things. So, so the first thing that I did was, you, you know, I, I, I created a bit of, I created sort of a formal um, sort of research group, let's call it, right? And so Joe, you know, Greenstein was one of those. And then Ben Kaznoka, who I, who I talked about earlier, and my co-founder and I. And so the four of us would meet. Uh, in the office that David, you've come to many, many times, the old, you know, um, Flickster office. And every two weeks, we'd sit down for two hours. And, you know, Joel, my co-founder and I would share the results of our experiment and the current experiment. And, you know, we'd have a pretty organic conversation. Um, but there would be, for example, a set of slides and so on, that you know, we'd use to present and we'd build upon and, and so on. So there was like this continuity and a little bit of structure and a lot of support from, from a group that was invested in this process as much as we were. And I think I counted, I think we met 
40 or 50 times. Okay, we met wow. 40 or 50 times for two hours. So quite, quite a commitment, right? And I think there was a lot, of, there were a lot of benefits to that. One, uh, the continuity was a big benefit, right? The longevity was a big benefit, right? The other piece was these were friends and friends who, you know, I'd known for a really long time who I knew had my back and, and, you know, together with Joel, we had, we had, we had like a, a, a real feeling of, um, yeah, just love and support and like, and, you know, optimism and so on. Right. And so, mm -hmm. and we could kind of play off each other and, and, you know, as things kind of evolved. And I think that was incredibly helpful. Like we are social beings, right? Like by, by nature and seeing this process as one that was bigger than just trying to get to an end point, but one where we were sort of kind of probably respecting the journey as much as the destination in part because of the way we set it up in part because we were just really enjoying it and we loved to be around each other. And it was an excuse mm -hmm. to see each other regularly in a world where we don't see our friends, right. As often as we want to even pre pandemic. So I think, I think that was, that was really one, one big piece. And then I think the other piece, which is very different was that, uh, you know, Joel and I are both enterprise um, operators. And so we were just, it was very clear to us what we were looking for, which was a, a, a go to market, a sales process that we felt we could repeat over and over and over again. And, you know, that included things like, you know, the functional, like, would we want to sell into this functional area for the next three to five years? how much budget is there? What, what are the dynamics? Like, so it's sort of size and kind of mm -hmm. repeatability or an expansion of those budgets. And then, you know, um, uh, you know, uh, do we, you know, do we know, like, do we, act, do we have networks and specialized networks, uh, you know, in these areas where, you know, we could sort of validate these assumptions. And, and so, and also could it lend itself well to like a land and expand? That was another big one um, sort of mm -hmm. in terms of the sales process. Could it be something that could be a try before you buy? And so, so it was really looked at through like a go-to-market lens and, yeah. and at its core, it was at its core, like, is someone going to pay for this and pay a lot of money for this or not? Like how much does it actually matter to the, to that functional line of business leader? And I think, I think uh, having the clarity on what we were trying to solve for without or who we were trying to solve it for versus what exactly we were solving for mm -hmm. was really helpful. And I, I think because it made it a very human, a very human process, a very human process. Um, so, I'd say, I'd say, yeah, the, the community piece, um, sort of having a set of advisors and, and then also a little bit of formality around it, but not too much. And then also having a sort of a clear idea of who, and like, it was more, it's like a heartbeat, like, and being able to like humanize, mm -hmm. like who we were trying to serve in a very clear way, made the journey through the twists and turns, not just easier, but also enjoyable for us. And I don't, while I think there were, I definitely had my moments like of feeling really down on myself. Uh, they, they were few and they were like few and far between, or they weren't long lived. Like when I, when I think back to them, um, cause again, I knew there was in two weeks we were going to have, for example, you know, another, another meeting and repeat, repeat it again. And, and I just had to keep my, keep focused on that. Yeah. When you were thinking about kind of like who you're building for, I was also curious to what extent your previous experience, like building your company and even kind of your non-traditional background, like mm -hmm. getting an MBA, MBA, like persuading people to let you into this program or like sales at your previous company, kind of to what extent 
those experiences informed how you approached like what needs to be taught and kind of who you were building for in terms of mm. people for sales positions in other organizations? Yeah, I remember this pivotal moment. And again, I'm, I'm going to like reference the same names because, you know, these individuals played such a, a core part in the evolution of this story. I was, so we had done a number of these pivots and, and then I remember uh, even being distracted, let's call it like, by, by something completely outside of, of this general idea of learning. You know, we thought about different marketplace ideas and Uber for, for this. And at that time, there was a lot of kind of energy around that type of, that type of framework. And then I remember uh, a friend of mine had a wedding and we had gone down to LA and, and uh, on the flight down, his best man actually happened to be on the flight, also a friend, also became a friend. And so we were sitting uh, all together in a row and just talking about kind of what's going on on a work on, on the work side. And he, he, I was struggling and he was doing really well in a business that's in kind of the home and garden space. Uh, it's called back to the roots. And he they must they might have been like four or five years into it and i was asking him like wow you're like the model entrepreneur because it was a really great business makes a lot of money it has high impact you just love the work that you're doing like it just flows you know from within you and he he said like listen i made this very clear decision in my mind that i was going to pick an industry that i wanted to spend the rest of my life with in and whether or not this business worked or not uh is inconsequential and it's like, I just think about like, you know, Naval's play long-term games with long-term people. My, my, my first couple of businesses were in ad tech and there are many long-term games to play and long-term people playing those games, but it wasn't a game that I necessarily wanted to play at that part of my life. So I was sort of starting it all over again. And the, the real doubling down on education, like the spark talks and some of these earlier ideas were also rooted a lot in entertainment, you know, as much as they were education, but the doubling down on education happened in that moment where I realized that of the various kind of industries adjacent education was one that I felt the deepest connection to uh, because of that background um, that I've had in the education system and kind of coming into the adult world. So we get off that flight go to the, uh, you know, go to the hotel and so on. And we meet up with Joe and, um, and his wife, Rachel. And, and of course they're advising me, right? Like every two weeks. So we go for a walk down the beach and I remember her saying, Hey, I was just on, I was just thinking about doubling down on education. You know, what do you think? And he, he was like, I've got this great idea for like corporate learning. Like you really should do something kind of take this spark talks, talks idea and really build it out into something that's more enterprise focused and, learning and so on. And uh, I just remember leaving that trip with this renewed energy and a renewed vision, and maybe even a little bit of, of lightness, like that was created from the acceptance that, that this was, this was like a journey that like very clearly a journey I was on. And this particular next thing I do you know, doesn't necessarily, it doesn't, I don't have to like put all the eggs in it, in that one basket. It doesn't have to be like the most outstanding kind of, you know, God's gift to the earth, you know, cure for cancer. Uh, I began starting to see it as, you know, an evolution of, of like a bigger, something bigger for myself that could be lifelong. And, and then when I started to really kind of build that personal connection with, with that vision, I started to really see myself within it. And that's where I began thinking, ah, well, like, I wonder what about folks who don't have college degrees? Hmm, I wonder if there was something we could do because I remember I was in that place. I don't have a four-year college degree. And I was looking for this combination of learning and community as a way of, of changing my life. And, oh gosh, I sort of stumbled into this whole thing. So, I started going down that path in terms of personalizing it and it started to make so much 
not just so much sense, but it started to take on a completely different meaning. And I, that was a, I, that was probably the biggest inflection point in the journey where things snapped into place. And like, I haven't looked back since. That was uh, four, four and a half years ago, almost five years ago. Five years ago was the, the flight and the... Yeah, the was that flight, flight, the flight to, the, the, yeah, flight to so Irvine 20, and the walk down the 2016? 2016. I think it wow. was the summer of 2016, yeah. Summer or fall yeah. of 2016, yeah. Wow. Yeah, I mean, these, these things these things take some time sometimes to get qu- quite their footing. Uh, yeah. You know, and I, I wonder, you, you mentioned the term education, right, which is so broad and so big. Mm-hmm. And I wonder when you talk to somebody new who's thinking about kind of collaborating on the SV Academy kind of vision and kind of long term, uh, mm. are people typically, you know, it feels almost like the the sales driven education thing is, you know, is what what it's all about today. But I wonder mm-hmm. kind of if you were to fast forward 10 years you know, or 20 mm. years, how mm. do you think, you know, how do you talk about this or how do you think about what this looks like on the kind of longer arc, kind of the decades arc? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I think because of my relationship with education from an early age, outcomes were very central to me in, in sort of making sense of what does actually education mean for me and like how might we want to approach solving for like a systems problem. So when I think about outcomes, what I've, what's really become clear to me is that the potential of what we're doing is not just about like imbuing these skills and like an entry level job, you know, for someone, which in itself is significant. For example, like we create about $50,000 of income expansion in just a couple of months. Like we're doubling or tripling somebody's income, right? Wow. Like in, in, in eight weeks and that in itself is at an individual level is transformative, right? For that, for that individual, for their family, for their, you know, for their Mm -hmm. um, community. But when you take, when you take this, this kind of very um, well connected, rigorously qualified um, group of, of highly ambitious, motivated individuals out in the industry working for some of the, you know, fastest growing, you know, biggest companies, kind of future of work employers out there. The opportunity is really to change the the very fabric of, of the industry, like at a molecular, like a molecular level. And what I mean by that is, there's, first of all, the obvious piece of SV Academy focusing on underrepresented job seekers. And therefore, 70% of the individuals in, in our community who are working, you know, for four or 500 employers, uh, SaaS, typically SaaS companies today, um, who have started in sales, but not necessarily, you know, stayed in sales, they represent, uh, you know, a set of cultural and racial uh, and otherwise um, underrepresented communities, uh, you know, in a way where um, they are, are, they are like bring, like they're bringing like new ideas and new energies and new lenses and skills uh, to, to their employers and, and to their industries. And that in itself is, incredibly special and then when you kind of add both the diversity as well as the the point i made earlier around the 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 self-identification as a Mm -hmm. as a learner then uh there's something very very powerful that that is possible uh and and that's something i'm very very excited about like i've been working in the in in tech, I've been working in SaaS and enterprise for my entire career. It's an incredible industry. It's also not just homogenous, but it can also feel um, transactional. And I was at Oracle for almost three years, and I felt Oracle is this incredible brand, incredible platform, incredible distribution and network and so on. But at times it felt 
uh, sort of stagnant, uh, and 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 of course, like homogenous. Um, and, and when I think about the potential of like infusing the industry, infusing these these highly influential global, you know, employers and networks with with the community of SV Academy graduates, the potential of what what could happen beyond just the d- diversification, but I'm talking about like the real sort of um, like the innovation. Uh, the productivity, the mm-hmm. uh, you know, the sense of integration into the broader world, uh, feels like a much, much bigger vision than one that was was very present for me when we started about with the brown bag lunch idea uh, all those right. years ago. Yeah, it seems like there's there's aspects. You know, people talk about sort of the unbundling of education, kind of the re rebundling in different components of it. It feels like there's almost certainly a kind of a new type of credential that this would represent. Is that Mm -hmm. kind of the core of kind of the, what, what this looks like or is it's like a new kind of a brand that people can recognize as a, as a way to transition to this kind of role or employment or, you know, is it, is it a few other kind of segments Mm. of that unbundling or how do you, how do you think about sort of that unbundling rebundling feature? Yeah, I think there's, I, I think, yeah, certainly like there is this rebundling of, of, um, you know, both the, both the credential and the networks and the employment connections and opportunities into, into this new package that, you know, is far more accessible, you know, financially, uh, than, than the traditional higher education bundle. I think that's absolutely uh, relevant. I also think that it's just, it is, uh, 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 it's like turning the whole system on its head. And so, you know, typically higher education, the model is really like a, a manufacturing model. It's a, kind of like a supply mm-hmm. chain, right? Like you start at the beginning with, you know, admissions, and then, you know, you, you get enrolled, and then you pick your classes, and you kind of repeat that rinse and repeat, you know, over some number of years, and then, you know, at the end, uh, you know, you you have a, a piece of paper and a credential that hopefully will help, you know, signal to employers that you are qualified to do a particular job well. But of course, uh, that doesn't work or hasn't, you know, be, been been working well for a really long period of time, uh, given that, you know, 50 55 percent of graduates uh you know in their first three years out of school are underemployed or unemployed and i'm sure COVID has just completely like smashed that even to like you know to little bits and it's just even worse now to a model where i think about it as an ecosystem and at the center of that ecosystem is the employer and within the ecosystem it is the it is really the 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 influence of the the employer that's driving uh, the the interactions and the collisions uh, in 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 the community, uh, and so it's not linear uh, in the sense that you know it's not like uh, you go through this process once. It's actually something that is continuously uh, an experience that you are having around. Uh, learning and employment or income uh, opportunity uh, through the rest of your life. And I think you need to sort of, I think the analogy of the bundling and unbundling is a good one to sort of start to get your head around what might be possible and where the market is going. But I think, you know, if you spend more time in it the way that I do, it's really clear that you actually have to fundamentally rethink that analogy in and of itself. And you really need to start thinking about it you know, uh, in a way that is more virtuous, in a way that resembles more of an ecosystem framework than a linear one. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. I'm, I'm kind of also curious, like, what is kind of pricking at you or top of mind as you think of just how the ecosystem is evolving and your place in it, how to better support the fellows that you're serving and HR teams that you're working with, but I mean, anything else as well? Like what, what are you kind of curious about these days or keeping an eye Mm. on? Well, 
Well, I think the thing that's the last year has really made present for me is the again the humanity, you know, in in the world, the humanity in in the workplace. Um, I've seen you know just in, even in our own little ecosystem, sort of um, expressions of that in terms of people reaching out and and offering to help others that they may never have met before or don't really have like a kind of a typical kind of social connection with just as a result of them being a fellow human, uh, you know, on a similar journey. And I think, you know, we've for often when we've talked about learning and upskilling and education to employment, we tend to focus very much on the technical skills. And so in our context, that might be, do you understand the way marketing automation works? And can you turn the knobs and, or, you know, Salesforce automation, that kind of thing. And we sort of don't spend as much time on what the industry calls soft skills. Some thought leaders call power skills. I have not come up with something better than human skills or human centered skills, because that's yeah. really what it means to me. And my curiosity really goes toward how to really help like engender that um, that skill set uh, in context of of work and I feel we're just scratching the surface of what that means right now but the last year has made it has really shown a light on that the importance of that for me. And not not only that it has a place in the workforce, but that it's it will be like necessary. It will be a competitive competitive advantage uh, to to focus as much on the people skills as as we might how to use you know email marketing or or a CRM system. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cool. I, I know we're um, we're hitting the end of the hour. We agreed to to spend the yeah, other night. Sure. I know yeah. the time has just has just flown by for me. I mean, it was just so fun to get to yeah. hear from you Likewise, and catch up and actually yeah. hear the story through time because it's you know I've I've been sort of a sideline cheerleader and you know aware of but not kind of yeah. in the in the details the way you are. So it's great to kind of hear that story. Um, be, before we before we formally wrap though, I was gonna mention um you know we we didn't really talk that much about kind of what the team structure looks like today. You mentioned mm -hmm. a little bit of the, the distributed team nature. And mm -hmm. one of the things I think when people get excited or inspired about what it is you're building and the vision for it, you know, they want to know, like, how can I help? And so I wonder if mm -hmm. you can tell us just a little bit about, you know, kind of as a, as a wrap, a little bit about kind of what SE Academy looks like today in terms of distributed culture and time zones and mm -hmm. roles and functions that you might be uh, recruiting for at the moment. Um, so yeah, a, a, any words you could share about that might be a nice yeah for, yeah uh, so yeah so we are we are now seeing ourselves as a fully distributed company we have our physical offices and we're even thinking about sort of co-location for certain smaller pockets of of teammates wherever they might be as um sort of occasional meetup spots and so on but otherwise you know very kind of invested in in the distributed workforce and then in terms of the the way the workforce itself is is organized uh it's you know there ways in which that will feel very familiar um as, as someone who understands education there's you know there's like a um, there's a marketing function uh, you know, to, to get people into the ecosystem, there's like the training and assessment, and then there's the, the career or customer success piece, which is very closely tied to the employers. And I think the areas where we need, where we're most excited about having new conversations and bringing new talent is um, really bringing bright minds from both the B to C, especially B to C, because it's not a background like you know endemic to Joel and, and myself. Uh, uh, like growth and product oriented thinkers and and doers and dreamers uh, to help us take what we've created, um, this magic that we've created that's you know now produced almost a hundred million dollars in in offers for for our wow. our community. And, and how do we take that and make it a billion dollars and $10 billion and $100 billion? Because the potential is there. And in fact, 
like the need is there. This is a moment in our, you know, history, in our society where there are tens of millions of people in this country alone that need get, to get back on their feet in the next couple of years. And the tech industry or tech enabled employers, like that's really where you know, most of the, the opportunity is, um, certainly, you know, when we think about future of work. So there's a ton of, of, of opportunity, a ton of upside, and we need to kind of really uh, beef up, we need to boost you know, the, the DNA in the organization around scale. And it's something I'm, I'm really, really excited about for us and for, for our whole market. And I'd love to talk to, to anyone who feels compelled and, and connected with what we're doing. That's, That's awesome. great. Awesome. Well, I know, I know we're, we're over time. I'll, because you're talking about uh, B2C and if there's anything in that kind of the consumer world that we might ever be helpful with, uh, please yeah. do reach out because it's something that we're passionate about and you might, you might recognize already, but Misty and I love learning about people's stories and asking a lot of questions. So if you ever mm. wanted to, for example, I, you know, I, I just think out loud, like if you, I, I'd love to hear from an SE Academy, you know, pre-student yeah. or yeah. kind of a success case, what is mm. it, what were they thinking when they applied to the program and what did that feel like or sound like, or how risky did that feel at the time? And then sort of how did that outcome, because it sounds like you really mm. can generate substantial outcomes that I think would be really interesting stories to tell because it would also oh, help yeah. inspire that next wave of people who might, uh, you know, who might be interested in SV Academy. Uh, so if we can be helpful with, you know, if telling those stories, if you want us to host people, if you want oh, yeah. to be there with our support, just let us know. We're, we're happy to do that. I would love that. When you reached out to me actually recently, I thought that my first thought was like, oh, great. We need to, we need to talk about this, you know, particular scale opportunity. And so I'd love that. Um, I will, I'd love that. I, I'll definitely give you a holler because it's very top of mind right now. And, and, um, yeah, I think we can make it go a long way. So yeah, I'd love to do that. Thank you. Cool. All right. All right it's man. been a joy. It's a total pleasure to talk and catch up. Yeah. Hey, yeah. Bye. Thanks Thanks so okay. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, Misty. Okay. Bye. Yeah.